Good morning. Yes, I have a seat here to uh, rescue me in case I need it. Um, I had an incident. I was, um, you know that those um, mountain peaks, there's the flat top and the, the sharp, what's that one called? Sharp top, those mountains where you can go rappelling. I did not do that. <laughs> I was getting out of my car, which is really a bad thing, uh, that's, but I, um, I hyperextended my knee, and if, ever, if you've ever done that, then you know, owie. So I have been uh, couch bound and um, loading ibuprofen for the last several days, but today is my best day yet. Sounds like a Hallmark card, doesn't it? I'm not sure that's good, but it is, and I'm happy to be here with you. This morning, we're beginning a new series from the book of Galatians called Stand Free. And I say it strongly like that. I think you'll catch on why I'm saying it like that. Uh, That's probably the nicest way you'll hear it uh, all morning long. Have you ever been around a group, a bunch of extreme academics? Not just college grads, you know, but two or three doctorate types. People that maybe you think um, they'd be better wearing smocks and white coats, white lab coats and, you know, pocket protectors. Just brilliant people who made you somehow, probably unintentionally, feel like you could never measure up, let alone have a a normal conversation. What did you have for lunch? You can't do it. The Apostle Paul was the most learned of all academicians, and if anyone could have made you feel small, uh, diminutive, lacking, with no way to ever measure up, it was Paul. But that was not Paul, not where we find him now. The learned Jewish theologians of the day did make people feel bound to do whatever they said, establishing a system, a hierarchy where you and I were measured by the tenets they taught and our ability to keep them. But not Paul. Paul got in with people. A Jew of Jews got involved with the Gentiles, the unclean, barbarian Gentiles, as they were thought of um, um, by the Jews, because he ached for them to be free. It drove him. It motivated him. Paul knew why God had sent Jesus Christ. He knew the ancient book of Isaiah, which foretold the coming of the Savior and what and how he would do that. And that knowing influenced him, empowered him from the core of his spirit-filled being. This book of Isaiah, this passage from Isaiah, this foretelling of what was to come. We read from Isaiah, from chapter 42, verse 5. This is what God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you, he's speaking now of the Messiah, Jesus, I have called you in righteousness, I will take hold of your hand, I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. The Gentiles, which is everybody that's not a Jew, the Gentiles were those who did not know God. The Jews themselves had long removed themselves from interacting with them to much of any extent, let alone tell them about Jehovah in an inviting way. They'd given that up. The Gentiles were therefore blinded in that darkness, and they were captive to it. And Jesus, whom we know as the light of the world, the one who would be the covenant, the new covenant that we've been talking about, made in his blood, 
would one day be born on a rescue mission, a freedom mission. In Paul's day, that had happened, and Jesus had happened to him. And through his gospel, the one that he preached wherever he went, people had been reached, Gentiles, and they believed in the freedom of Christ, what he brought to them, they believed. And churches, gathering places for these brand new believers had begun. And these were vulnerable, um, sort of baby churches, baby believing churches in Galatia. And they were in grave danger, not just a little bit, but grave danger, threatened. And Paul, Mr. Grace, is not going to sound very gracious in, by the words he chooses, how he says them, how he writes them. And it's very likely that, therefore, I won't sound that way either today. But that is how grave the threat to the churches, the vulnerable baby churches of Galatia was. We're going to see how this threat looked to Paul and to the young, vulnerable Galatians. Now, here's some backstory. Paul comes from a system of getting along with God that, as we've seen over the last few weeks, must be kept separate from the system in which he now lives. The system of law and rules could only diagnose our troubles, our sicknesses, our inabilities, leading us to faith in Christ, who is the remedy, the cure for lifelessness, because he gives us life, remedy for diagnosis. This system that Paul came from stretched all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when God warned, if you eat of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. He meant it. And they did. They died spiritually. They became lifeless apart from God. Though they were ambulatory, they had not the life of God. It took a lot of years for them to pass away physically. But that ultimate passing was preceded by what God calls death. It happened years before to them. But fast forward, and that death ended in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, who offers life, God's life, God himself, where once was only lifelessness. That is our gospel. That is the gift God offers to people. This is why Paul said that we cannot minister the law anymore because it was a ministry of death, a servant to get you and me to quit a diagnosis life only, without life, a life of death, and to accept the remedy of life through faith in Jesus Christ. In that way, the letter of the law, the prescription of the law would serve its purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you'll see it on the screen beginning in verse 6. Here's what Paul wrote to them. He's made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, which means what? Are we competent as he made us competent as ministers of an old covenant? What's the answer? No. No. He's made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious, more effective? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Now, let's make some points today that will help us navigate this letter to the Galatians, all six chapters of it. First thing, 
The law was given to drive us away from the law to Jesus. That's why it was given. The Jews had been watering down the law for centuries, trying to manage it. From 10 laws to 613 laws in the day that Jesus shows up on the stage to bring it to an end. They had added 603 more laws, not as a way of honoring God, but as a way of managing this system, getting along with it, making it workable. But Jesus was, was saying, it's not manageable. The law was to take us, to lead us somewhere else. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Therefore, the law has become our guardian to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. It had a job. That's it. John chapter 1, verse 17, it's not on the screen. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Big difference. Huge difference. It made Paul rightly angry, some would say, perhaps furious, that anyone would teach the law to believers, particularly to Gentile believers, who never had it, never knew it to begin with, so Paul is angry as he writes this letter to the Galatians. Why? Here's why. The believers in Galatia were being pressured and induced to do something terrible. To choose both grace and law. To poison to both. That's what was happening at the Galatian church to the Galatian believers. They were being assaulted with it. Truth is, you have, to cho- you have to choose. Here's the truth. It's either faith in Moses, law, or faith in Jesus, grace. It's one or the other. That's the good news. That's what Paul is going to be telling them. It's one or the other. You cannot mix the two. If you add grace to law, for example then law loses its power to condemn and drive you to death so you can be cured with Jesus. Does that make sense? Concerning your sin, if you've bought a mixture of the two, law and grace, you'll say things like this whenever you blow it. Well, I mean, God wants us to do our best and he takes care of the rest. That's it? It's not true. Or this one. You can sin a little bit, you know, you know, breaking a commandment here or there. And, and God, he looks the other way. It's not true. Or this one. Jesus didn't really mean you should cut off your hand or gouge out your eye if you violate the smallest detail of the law. He was speaking in generalities. You know, he, he, he did that all the time. Which makes you wonder, which times was he doing that, if he was doing that? But if that's you, if that's where you are with this a mixture, well, okay then. You won't consider that Jesus was actually ministering the exact letter of the law in order to exhaust his hearers and lead them to what he was going to give them for free life, and righteousness, finally, for nothing, for free, through faith. As we'll see in chapter 5, the law is an all-or-nothing proposition. If you try to keep one aspect of it, you know, just one, I can do it, that'll be enough, you are obligated to try for it all. No other choice. On the screen, you'll see, you cannot obey the law 85% of the time, you know, and get full credit with God. You can't get any credit with God. You get zero, nothing. Why? It's not the purpose of the law. 
That's not what it's for. That's not what it's doing. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 says this, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight. No one by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, what happens? We become conscious of our sin. Want to have a bad weekend? Load up a bunch of laws and see how it goes. You'll be conscious that you can't keep them. Not all of them. Even if you get 8 out of 10, what does that get on the scale? Zero. You break one, you've broken them all. And why should we become conscious of our sin? Why? So we can get remedy and be cured by grace and life in Christ. That's the point. Let me say it this way. The purpose of the law is to prove you're dead without God and to lead you to Jesus so he can give you what you don't have. Life. Law is diagnosis. It's not life. There's nothing to it for that. On the other hand, if you add law to grace, then grace loses its freeing and life-giving power because you'll be induced to look to rules of performance by which to live. And in your mind, you'll be condemned as you fail because you'll be attempting to live without life, without Jesus in you. And concerning your performance, you'll say things like, how come this isn't working? How come Christianity doesn't work for me? I'm doing the best I can. You'll abandon looking to Jesus for life talking to him, reading about him, singing to him as we did just a, just a bit ago. You'll abandon all of that as a way of life. And the very purpose of the Holy Spirit in you to form Christ in you as you look to him as your righteousness, holiness, and redemption will be frustrated. And you wonder what's gone, gone wrong. I'm doing the best I can. Fortunately, you are set up, if you're in Christ and Christ is in you, you are set up for the Holy Spirit to make sure you know, don't go this way. Bridge out. Are you tired yet? He'll make sure you know something you've got to know. It's not this way. And that, this was the threat that was happening to the Galatian believers. They weren't looking badly, ugly, like Maybe their relatives over in Corinth, the Corinthian Christians, who looked awful. The Galatians looked good. They were model citizens, getting even more model-y. Is that a word? I don't think so. Anyway, they were trying, they were working to get better because they didn't believe. They were good enough with God already because of him. And as we'll see later in this letter, the letter to the Galatians, they were missing the grace of God. Missing it. So let me say these two things clearly so you've got them and I can feel good about my life. <laughs> the purpose of the law is to condemn whomever it serves to drive them to Jesus for salvation. That's it. That is what it's for. The purpose of grace is to rescue whomever it serves with the life and freedom of Jesus Christ. All the time. 24-7. That is the purpose for both. It's one or the other. I actually thought about changing the word it in the second statement uh, to he because while the law is letters, letters on a page, grace is Jesus. It's him. Life at work in you and with you by the Holy Spirit. I guess I chickened out. I'm not sure. Maybe next time. Now, 
Here's our theme verse for our Stand Free series. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to visit it a number of times. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Would you read this aloud with me? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. This word, freedom, in the Greek language means literally without restraint. In other words, it is for without restraint that Christ has set us without restraint. Doesn't that seem crazy? It seems crazy, but it's because in the New Covenant, in the, from the New Testament, by the gospel and your belief, God lives where? In you. If he didn't, then without restraint would be nuts. But you're not like that. If you've received Jesus, then he lives in there. Let me ask it this way. Does Jesus need commands to behave himself? Jesus, you know how you're always going off. Would you please act like God today? No. Does he need laws? Does he need rules to behave himself in you and through you? No. He doesn't need them at all. That's why you don't need restraint. Because you have him in you. And getting to know him is the greatest delight in the world because he's not the God who's out there alone. He's happiest to be where? Yeah, in you. Listen to what Paul wrote in the book of Romans about this freedom achieved for us by Jesus. This reminds us of Romans 8, verse 21, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Are you kidding? No, it's true. This creation, this planet does not have what we do. It doesn't have the freedom. It doesn't have the glory of God in us. It's going to be brought into that with us, from us, because of us. What a plan. So, if you're going to know God, it won't be because you work to please Him by keeping rules and laws. It will be because you learn to let Him work to free you and to keep you free. His favorite thing to do with the church. Freedom! If you're feeling down, if you're feeling lost, if you're feeling worked over and roughed up, What's his ministry going to be to you? Freedom! It'll be that. All the time. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Say it with me. Freedom! Will there be a day with God where he goes, no, no, not in the key, but that was yesterday. Not today. No. Never. Not one day, because it's his thing. <laughs> it's what he does with you. It's his pleasure, freedom, and freedom from an old system of slavery, a yoke of slavery, which was the law, because you've been led away from the law to Jesus Christ. What kind of freedom? Freedom from death, freedom from sin, freedom from shame, freedom from guilt, Freedom from fear. That is what he is about with you. That's your hope. Because that's how he is with you. That was Paul's fight. And I think it's ours too. I can tell you it's certainly mine. This is why I'm here with you. This is why. I have known this in me for a lot of years. And it has induced me this hope, this freedom crusade of God has made me, led me to do things that I would have thought, no, call me a coward, I don't care. It's carried me, taken me places because I have to give it. And I'll bet you do too. That's the plan. 
So we're going to have to insist upon freedom. Insist upon it. If you've been around the church, upon all things Christendom, for more than a couple years, more than one year, you know this word freedom has been tortured and twisted into something it's not. It can't possibly mean without restraint. Oh, yes, it does. It's exactly what it means, because God lives in you now. You don't need restraint. That was the law to prove to you that you needed him. If it's, this is, it's going to be, have to be one or the other is what I'm saying. It's either, if it's law, then you'll exist in regular condemnation. You can if you want. I don't recommend it. If it's grace, then you will live and get well acquainted with life and freedom. And we're going to have to stand up and proclaim this. Because many in the church don't believe it. They've accepted a mixture of law poured into grace or grace poured into law either way. It's powerless. It's not doing its job. Either one. So in order for you to stand free, you're going to have to fight for this. Jesus is your champion. Paul is your role model. And now we're the ones who take up the fight for freedom. And now then, chapter 1. Welcome to Galatians. (laughs) Let's get there. Galatians, chapter 1. Let's begin reading Paul's letter. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Yes, that's our gospel. And Paul gives the gospel, in my mind, in a sort of a reverse order, from resurrection back to crucifixion. He's reminding them of where they were and how they were at that very moment that they read this. That's what happened to you. Remember this. You're actually now in Christ. You were crucified. You were raised with Him. Now you're in Christ, in Him, holy, blameless, righteous, in Jesus, your new creations. And he's reminding them of how they got there by being included through faith in God's rescue of lifeless, sin bound, slavish man through the cross. That's what he's done. You do people a great service when you ask them, hey, what do you think of that? How about that cross? Where were you when that happened? Or how about that resurrection? Where were you when that happened? That'll get you a conversation. You were in him through faith. Now, we've been talking about this, well, a lot, but especially the last two weeks. We talked about these compound words where God did something miraculous for us, but more importantly, with us, together with Jesus, that ended death, ended diagnosis, and gave us life. Through faith in Jesus, you'll see it on the screen, believers have been brought into union with Jesus and been co-crucified, co-buried, co-raised, co-seated in heaven with him and been made co-heirs and co-workers with him. All those are compound words. They didn't just happen to him, they happened to you. My question would be, how cool is co? Pardon me. But it is. When he did it, so did you. He took you with him. Paul also reminds them of their continued standing, their condition, their expectation of how the days and the life of God will be in the future once they've been past crucifixion and past resurrection as new creations. He says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, grace and peace to you. Remember from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, remember this, grace. And peace to you, in case you forgot, in case it got out of your head. Grace means that we got and we get everything with God for free. 
without him requiring that we handle everything well because of Jesus. That is grace. Peace with God means we have been given the assurance of always being in perfect condition with God because of Jesus. He did it. He brought you into himself, and the last time I checked, ain't nothing dirty or damaged in him can't be. That's where you are, and that's how you are. And this is what we offer on Sunday mornings. This is what we've been offering on Thursday, uh, Theology Thursdays. That's what we're doing our best to offer to the church who needs this and needs to get into the fight for this gospel. Anything outside this gospel could very well be a threat and a deception Because it might induce you to do something that Jesus has not yet done. You have to do it. In other words, it is in that way anti-Christ. He didn't do it, so you have to. That is where error is. That is where slaves are made. In that place. Most every deception, full assault, or subtly cloaked, is directed at these truths. Right there. Jesus wasn't enough. Even though he said it is finished, he he, he didn't. In that whole generality thing, no, it was finished. Done. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul says, and you can hear him, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. That's not nice. No, it's not. And now you know why. Foul. It's perverted. It won't get you where you need to go if it's law, and it won't get you what you have. If it's Christ, if it's grace. Verse 9. And we have already said, so now I say again. If anybody is preaching to you, like like we didn't get this point, if anybody's preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. That's how important this is. And that's how important it was to the Galatians and to the Warrentonians. I pushed that one, didn't I? See, the gospel, what it means is good news. Good news. In other words, this false gospel is less than good news. And always, as I've said, it's antichrist, meaning Jesus didn't finish it. He didn't do it. So there's something more you have to do. It's the gospel of more, if I could say it that way. So that it might sound like this. If you'll pray more, you'll be healed more. If you will give more money, you will be made more wealthy. If you will do more at church and please God more, he will bless you more. If, you will, if, if, if you'll vote more in line with a certain view of our country, or of your, yours, depending upon where you're watching this, You can save our nation. If you will embrace Jewish customs and laws more, you know, the things that God put in place for those ancient people that were chosen by him, his real people, then you'll be better off, more better off than you are now. That was the lie coming to the Galatians. Add back into the mix some law. Add it back. You can be more better. Which means what? It didn't work. They weren't led to Jesus in whom they have all things. You can't get more better when you're with God, when you've received him. 
you are better. You can't get perfecter. You've been made perfect in him. And these are Gentile believers to make it worse. They didn't know Moses or the law or anything about any of that. And so a group of elders counseled Paul to tell the Gentiles only the following. Acts chapter 21, verse 25. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, don't you be drinking that, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. That's it. That's all there was. That's all we've got for them. We don't want you teaching the Gentiles classes on contrition and how to feel badly and sorry for violating God's commandments that they never knew because that made God sad and mad. So you better tell them, no. Uh Uh-uh. The gospel to the Gentiles began and ended with Jesus Christ. I'm not saying don't delve into the the back story of, of God. Get in there, it's great. I love the Old Testament. But it's old. And it was for Jews and not for this Gentile. I love discovering it, but it's not a way to live. It's a way to be diagnosed. That's all. If these baby believers didn't get this, then they would accept a Christianity that is not Christianity. And weeks, months, maybe years later, here's what they'll say. Christianity doesn't work for me. Not knowing they'd lost Christianity. What they had wasn't Christianity, but they didn't know it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that phrase. Christianity doesn't work for me. Do you think they had Christianity, those who said it? Not one time. Ever. It was something less, something other than. But they didn't have life. They were mixing it. Mixing grace with law and law with grace. You know how this goes? People are clamoring to make disciples any way they can, so they'll pick you off to their particular gospel, theological or political or economic, so they can get influence with you, maybe get your money, get some power. It's a clamoring that we have to navigate. We'll only do it by staying, remaining in the gospel. Remember, this is it. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. If I want, excuse me, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So what's he saying? Well, a bunch of things that are pretty, pretty evident, but at least one of them is Paul was not motivated to build anything for himself. He wasn't looking for a fan club. He wasn't looking to make followers. He didn't go to Jerusalem. He went to the desert. See ya, gotta go. And this gospel, maybe you've noticed, is not very pleasing to a lot of people. Let me say it this way. If people wanted to crucify Jesus for the gospel he gave, guess what might happen to you or feel like is going to happen to you? No. I know. And it's always this. It can't be that good. Have you diagnosed yourself lately, Ralph? Have you seen how you behave? I know. That was diagnosis for death and condemnation. I have life now. He is my life. It's him. I've got remedy and diagnosis. The Corinthian church faced the same trouble. Paul wrote to them in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. 
But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to all kinds of doctrine, to law and grace. No, to Jesus Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Sheesh. In the same chapter, Paul says that he was looking and working to cut the ground from under false apostles, deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. He writes in verse 14 in 2 Corinthians 11, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Our gospel is that we are beneficiaries of our benefactor. But it's not always popular. It may not give you anything to motivate you by guilt. Um, a way to earn God's grace. We're beneficiaries. We're not participants in the covenant. We only get the benefits. This is not, you're not going to hear anybody say, but here's a way you can earn something from God. Try this. No. So what can you do? How about simply being thankful? Growing in grace. Loving people. Telling people the gospel. That'll do it. That might be the plan. And now Paul begins to reflect upon his Mr. Law days of dispensing behavioral prescriptions and subsequent condemnation and death. Verse 13 in Galatians 1, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Ah, what's wrong with tradition? How did Paul, previously known as Saul, try to destroy, destroy the church? Did he just legislate against it, you know, take some food away from them? No, he tried to kill them. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if they found any there who belonged to what? Us, who belonged to the way. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And then what? Off with their heads. Watch out for traditions. Paul was a murderer to preserve the traditions of his fathers. You have to watch out for that. Shall we submit to traditions just because they're so old? Or shall we submit ourselves to the truth because it makes us free? The gospel we love is the gospel promised to Abraham and to Ezekiel, to, to Isaiah, to Jeremiah, to David. And if it doesn't rest upon freedom and fullness in Christ, get rid of it. And here's Paul's, Paul's motivation all the way from Isaiah, as we quoted to begin this morning. See if you recognize it. Verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. There it is. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to see those who were the apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. What was it that pleased God? Not only to call Paul to salvation and grace, but to reveal Christ in him. Why? Because of the effect Christ in Paul would bring about. And it's the same design today for you. That's why God loves to impress you with himself. He loves it. Because that impressing, that revelation of how good and true he is and how good his life is with you, that is going to induce you into some kind of work, large, small, in between, serving somebody a meal, going off into the mission field, whatever it is, he's planned for that before you were born. This is how this works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this, not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no man, no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You don't have to make it up. You're heading in. You're going to get there. That's a good thing. Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stay with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. This was a big one. The man who formerly persecuted us, I'd say, is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. And there we are. Paul was once dead, spewing out dead people's stuff. Now he's alive, and he's giving the gospel. He knew it, and we know it. This is the gospel of life. An end to the law and its motivation to get us to Jesus and a growing in the grace in the life of Christ in us. Amen? Amen. Father, here we are centuries later, wrapped up in the fight for truth, the fight against law, the fight against the slavery of that, and the fight for freedom, the fight for grace by which people know you, enjoy you, and grow without shame, without guilt, without fear, because you work to make them free and keep them free by what you do for us. Thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.